Right, hello. Thank you, new people, for attending and asking questions, which is great. That's what we like. So we have something new to talk about or to go deeper into whatever it is we have previously said. So Paul asking pure desire like hunger, how do we know if it's a pure desire or if subliminally we saw something that we wouldn't have realized we saw that triggered it? Well, and then Chris is asking about a house. How do we know if pure desire or thought-based desire? And he wants a house that's paid off for security, peace of mind, and so on. Um, or just having the desire because he says other people have that desire. And is a pure desire one that's with you your entire life since other desire would be accumulated along the way? Or can a pure desire be within us, but we don't realize until we see it in someone else? And you want to know what are some examples of a pure desire that is not eating? Okay, you have to understand this, uh, something, right? Desires uh, are things you want, and you want them for a reason. The main reason is because you're a human, and humans always want things, because things make life interesting. Then we have the survival instinct. I need to... Um, have the things to survive. Uh, so you have always wants. Now, we differentiate between the wants of the ego mind, uh, personality, which is what you've been formed into being. In the All is Mind workshop, you understand about the, the different types of our minds. And right now we'll talk about the body mind, which is a human, it's the animal, all right, the human animal. Uh, the body, so food, clothing, shelter, sex, uh, touch, affection, uh, pleasures, avoid pain, things like that. Now, you you know, a desire is also to avoid something. I desire not to be in pain. I desire not to get beaten up. I desire not to get robbed, something like that. That's still a desire, even though you might call it an aversion, but it's, it's a desire. So, there's the desires of the body, then there's desires of the ego personality which is formed which is I want a big car uh, I want a big house why so everyone is admiring me I want fancy jewelry fancy clothing so when I go into a restaurant they respect me maybe they'll seat me ahead of other people and so on so that's the ego desire and then we have just natural desires now there's natural desires of the body obviously survival um, and there's natural desires of the ego as well, which is also survival, like the house. Of course I want a house. Why do I want a house that's paid off? So I don't have to work to earn the money to pay the mortgage so that no one takes it away from me. So there's always um, desires and to know or even to ask which, where is it coming from, is showing you don't really understand the concept. The point of this lesson is to say that acknowledge where your suffering comes from and if a desire is causing you suffering that's a bad desire. So you desire to eat that causes you satisfaction. You desire a much bigger house which forces you to work much harder which forces you to stress over making money um, which causes you to work five years longer than you needed to work if you wanted a smaller house. So that's a bad desire. That causes you suffering. So differentiate the desire simply by does it create suffering or ease suffering. Now obviously having a nicer house is more comfortable than a small house. So you say, well, it, it, it eases suffering. But then do you really need the bigger house? Okay, so we go to another division. What's the difference between what I need and what I want? And so that's how you'll know what's what. Do I need it or do I want it? If I need it, then it's a good desire. And you work towards getting it and you'll be satisfied. If I just want it and then I want more and I want more and I want more, well, then that's a, a shallow desire that's going to cause you pain and suffering because you'll always be chasing uh, a goal that's never ending because the goal keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's that simple. What do I need versus what do I want? Desires will always be there. And if I'm 
realize that what I want is causing me pain and suffering, rather than ending my suffering, maybe you'll be able to have the wisdom to know what you really should chase and what you should really let go. Now this takes a long time, months, years, decades, of the alteration of your being, the way your mind actually functions, who you are, what your core values, your morals are, which is the idea of ethicalism, is to form the personality such that we have a better sense of values and morals and um, a realization of what's the point of life and what is pointless in life. Because it doesn't matter how big your house is, you're going to die. And you're going to leave that house behind when you die. So if you're going to spend an extra 10 years working harder to get the bigger house, which you're going to leave anyway when you die, wouldn't it be better to have enjoyed those 10 years? Right? And live in a comfortable house? So that takes a change in your personality, your character, your core values and morals. So this question and this topic is not one that's like, how much is one plus one? Two. That's a straight answer. We don't have a straight answer for anything of true value because anything of true value comes from the alteration of your being. So you actually are a different person, which means you interact with life in a different way. The events of life affect you differently. To get people to understand this and make the changes is not easy because it isn't direct. So we have to use uh, examples like the desires to show you that, you know, if there is a way I could change who I am, I would automatically have different desires. And as those desires change, I'll have a lot more pleasure by virtue of a lot less pain. So this is how we uh, have to understand the idea of desires. Simply, what do I need and what do I want? And that goes to the ultimate, what do I need and what do I want for my life? Like in your lifespan before you die. How do you want to spend your life? So that's what you can think of. I hope that gives you some clarity to your questions about it. So in Claire, is it really good to eliminate all negative emotions? Aren't some of them useful? For example, maybe fear prevents you from doing something bad or dangerous or deadly. Yes, I have a fear of jumping out of an airplane. I can fly an airplane. I can fly an airplane upside down. I can fly aerobatics because I know my airplane and I know what I can do with it. But I'm not going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane because you could land and break your leg. So that's just as an example. But Claire, please try to read um, the lessons about angry for and angry at. Uh, for example, Gandhi, uh, who my grandfather knew, so I have like first-hand knowledge of the man, um, was angry, very angry man. Nobody would know that or, or think that nowadays, but Mahatma Gandhi was very angry and he had said, I'm a very angry person and I use my anger constructively to give me the power to have the strength of will to endure all the attacks and pains and sufferings that he had to endure. He was angry for the injustice to the Indian people versus you being angry at the idiot driver. Now, the person who's driving, like in Penang, in Malaysia, where they like to drift, and if it's a three-lane road, one car tries to take all three lanes, slowly drifting between one and the other. Um, right now I'm in Mallorca, where they drive very well, but <laughs> live home base in, in uh, Penang for the last few years. So, I can be angry at that driver. I could also be angry for the poor instruction they received in how to drive. I can be angry for, they're just so stupid. They don't know how to drive well. They had a bad education. Harder to say that when it's an idiot driving like that, of course, but I'm trying to show you an example of getting angry for a cause. You have to be careful not to become an activist because activists usually get angry about a cause simply so they have something to fight for. 
and then logic goes out the window. So some activism is good, but a lot of activism is just to give somebody a reason to fight, to vent their anger, which is not good at all, of course. So angry, negative emotions are good when they fuel you to make changes, to do something good for the world, to good for other people, good for yourself. For example, I was poor, I was, let's say, treated poor, you know, or, or as if I was poor and how I was raised, although the family had money, I wasn't given clothing or <laughs> some basic necessities, made me very angry. Why should I have to suffer in this way when other people have a lot of money and everything they want? So I was extremely angry at how I was treated and my financial limitations. Of course, we're talking about five years old, ten years old, you know. So I used that anger to get me to work very hard and wisely to make a lot of money and uh, retire before I was 28 years old. I had enough money to live on by then. So I was angry for that injustice to me. I, I wasn't treated fairly and there was no reason for that other than, you know, some people wanted to treat me that way. And it wasn't fair. So I saw other people are in the same situation. They're poor, they're suffering. And I said, why is that? So I found a way to break past the limitations of life so I could help other people. So I was angry for the injustice to me and to others. And that fueled me to work harder to find a solution to help as many people as I could. So that's how negative emotions can be very positive, all right? So it's very simple. Um, any negative emotion that gives you energy to be creative, to work harder, to get out of bed every morning, to sleep three, four hours, and it's enough because you're so excited with what you want to do, even if it's fueled by this is terrible and something must be done, that's okay. But to have negative emotions that keep you in bed 10, 12, 15 hours a day, you hate to get up in the morning because you look a miserable day ahead of you and all of this, this is a terrible negative emotion. Okay? So you have to differentiate between angry for and angry at, the difference in different kinds of negative emotions, and then you'll know which is good, which is bad, and how to deal with that. Okay? So I hope that answers these two questions very well for you. And please, more questions, all the better. I'll make videos whenever I can as I'm traveling. Bye-bye.